May 6th is known as Wells Day to aficionados of the great director and actor Orson Wells, who was born on May 6th and lived until the age of 70 when he died in 1985. He is one of the greatest directors and actors in cinema history, certainly one of my favorites, and someone who, beyond just being a good actor and a good director, was someone who's influential on in my life in terms of the philosophy of how he lived his own life and the struggle that he had to go through to accomplish great things in his career early on, right through to the very end, actually. Someone who had a very, very tough time in some senses in life. He's someone who directed 13 feature films, and I would divide these films up <clears throat> into three distinct categories. The first category are the truly great films. These are films which absolutely you can put up there with the best of their genre, the best beyond all genres. They just contain fantastic acting and directing and editing and the stories are incredible. So the first and obviously his most famous is Citizen Kane, came out in 1941, often hailed, often tops the, the AV Cinema Club list of the greatest films of all time, although I think recently Vertigo, for whatever reason, overtook it from the critics, but for a long time it was Citizen Kane. And it's understandable why, because this is really a movie which the sheer scope of it it's barely even been matched by any modern movies in terms of how crazy a story it is, how deep it goes, how much it tries to, to put across on screen, the different set changes, all the techniques that were practically invented or innovated in order to get around certain problems which have since been adopted and become part of the dictionary, of the phraseology, the vocabulary of cinema itself and how movies were made since then. And so for me, in some senses, it is the first truly great film of all movies. I mean, I've watched a lot of the silent movies and some of the movies that before then in the 30s a lot of them are quite creaky a lot of them don't hold up some of them have good imagery or good ideas but none of them are like citizen kane and citizen kane in that sense is the first modern movie even though it was made 70 plus years ago so it is probably his best film it is one of the best films of all time now interestingly enough there's often a misunderstanding when it comes to the screenwriting of this movie because it's obviously credited not just to Orson Welles but to another individual. Now if you actually read some of the biographies of Orson Welles and you research into this topic, yes some of the movie was scripted by the other guy but the idea that that guy wrote most of it and the majority of it and Orson Welles just made the movie and took credit for screenwriting actually seems not really to match up with the facts. I mean in the great book Against the System they chronicle a lot of the notes, a lot of the back and forwards and a lot of the changes that were going on and really the timeline of it and it's quite clear that Orson Welles essentially took this screenplay and cut a lot of it out and rewrote most of it and restructured it and a lot of what makes Citizen Kane a fantastic movie is Orson Welles he's not the guy who wrote the screenplay the, the story itself could have been good but then again with a different director a different actor a different kind of talent cast around it it could have been a very average to just good film it wouldn't have been what Citizen Kane was which was a monument of cinema and it's a movie where I don't think in some sense you can overrate it. And as much as I often heard, the way it would usually be described to me in the early days of when I was young and I was growing up and I was hearing about these movies, is I remember some of my friends who took film courses or who took uh, media studies type classes and often they would be shown as in Kane and they would always say yeah I can see like you know why people think it's good or what it's achieved but it's not that good a film actually. And so as someone who often has very particular standards myself and doesn't like a lot of art and etc. I mean, I find all the stuff I like, so I'm able to populate my time with great stuff, but a lot of the stuff that's popular I don't necessarily vibe with. I was thinking, oh, is this going to be one of those things where, I mean, like some of the, like a movie, for example, like the, the Maltese Falcon. It's a good movie, but yeah, as someone who's a modern day cinema viewer, I don't see it as a great movie, and I do see a lot of the flaws that people will overlook because they, they realize how incredible it was at the time or what it was trying to do and how it was different from other films now that Citizen Kane is different from that like yes obviously some of the effects can't hold up to the same degree obviously the quality of the film isn't as good as you see in modern day some of the actors in the movie are just very throwaway and there's a reason you didn't see them in many movies beyond that and certainly no more great films but Orson Welles is incredible in his role you have a bunch of other good performances. The movie itself is told in a fantastic way. It's a very compelling story. It's a very unique way of telling the story, almost something that people like Tarantino have clearly pulled from and cribbed from in later years. And I think it really does stand up. It's a fantastic film, and it's a great place to start with. It's obviously the start of Orson Welles' film career, because before that, he was an actor on this theater, and he was doing radio work. But this was his first big chance. And unfortunately, the story of Citizen Kane is also the story of the downfall of Orson Welles to some degree. Because despite 
matter of fact, he made fantastic films after that and was an incredible actor and only improved in that respect. This was his one big chance to really have everything at his disposal because there were all sorts of things which again are outlined in that book against the system about how Hollywood kind of turned its back on him and the people in the film studio, there was a power struggle there and they decided they didn't like what they'd done with him because as Citizen Kane, they'd given him carte blanche. They'd given him this contract where he could control every element, including the final cut, all these aspects, and they put it out there and it didn't even get a chance to fully get the recognition and commercial success it should have had because actually the way it was released was like a limited release and didn't get a chance and it's almost like it was sabotaged from within and that became a prevalent theme throughout the early portion, the Hollywood portion of Orson Welles' career and it's really a tragic element when you consider what a great artist and visionary he was. So another film that I put in the truly great films category is Touch of Evil. Now this is a film where originally, yeah, he wasn't going to be the director. He could have been a mo an actor in it and thanks to Charlton Heston, the star of the movie, I mean, on paper, the marquee name, he was able to not just be an actor in the movie, but direct it as well. Now, it's true, they fucked with this movie in the editing. They tried, later on, years later, 20 plus years later, it was restored in terms of some of the elements of how the intro was done by Orson Welles and some aspects were restored, but it was never fully in some of those some of that was, was missing and you'll never be able to see the actual final version, but the version we have is still a very good movie. It is a truly great film. Now, in this case, it's obviously got that fantastic opening and it's got some great scenes in terms of how it's directed. I think if you think of the final shot with Malia Dietrich, um, that's obviously the way that's set up is very haunting. It's all fantastic in that respect. But another aspect that really carries this movie is Orson Welles acting in this movie is top tier. I mean, he plays a fantastic character that should have been a second or third character in the movie, but just takes over the movie. I mean, Charlton Heston can't even combat him, can't even hang with him. He has almost a wooden part in, in contrast, despite the fact Charlton Heston, obviously a very good actor in his own right. But what he does with this character of Hank Quinlan, this corrupt cop, but who at the same time is a very morally gray character. He isn't really a villain. He's an anti-hero and he's a very tragic figure, but at the same time he's compelling and, and you're intrigued by him and you can't cast him aside entirely. And you're going backwards and forwards on how you feel about what's happening. The way he gets and translates this character from the screen into your experience of the movie is incredible. I mean, it's one of the most memorable characters I've ever seen in any film and certainly incredibly nuanced. And his role in playing this character is fantastic. And funnily enough, at the time, he wasn't this big, fat, overweight guy that people remember from the latter years. And yet he, he puts on the prosthetics and he becomes that for this movie. But actually, at the time, he still was very charming, very good looking as he was earlier in his career when he really was. I mean, he was a baby face. He looked incredible. He was a Leonardo DiCaprio type leading man, or at least could have been if he'd continued down that route. And the other, the third film, I will cite as a truly great film is actually one of his last, which is F for Fake, which is a documentary film, which in some senses, the way it's shot is the birth of the modern documentary. What Citizen Kane did for cinema, for feature films, F for Fake does for documentaries. The way it cuts in different shots, the way it has an overarching narrative with little stories nested within it, the way it uses candid footage with storyboard reenactment type footage. It's so clever. It's so innovative. It's just, it, it's a movie that, explores and celebrates the magic of what film, what cinema can do. But at the same time, it's so playful with its ideas. It's so much fun and it's so funny in itself. And it also, if you ever look into the actual movie, makes you ask questions about what am I being shown and the way I'm being shown. This is why I say it's the birth of the modern do documentary. Because yes, it's biased and yes, it tells a story and not all of it's true and what is true and, and what are they trying to represent by the way this shot's done. And you'll soon find out when you start to look into this and pick apart the threads, a lot of it's not true. A lot of it's actually, it is playing with film and playing with ideas and fiction, but the way it's put together, it's so incredible. And you could naively believe it was all true. It obviously has a fantastic twist. I mean, a lot of people complain that they don't like the twist. I don't really understand unless they were watching in like VLC player and only watched the movie recently, how they could necessarily know that this twist was going to happen. I didn't certainly. I thought it was a fantastic little twist. And also, I think it's a great movie towards the end of his career to show that when Orson Welles had the time and he didn't need a massive budget and all the rest of it, just his editing skills alone, he became a master editor. He was very good in his early career, and he obviously had help in his early career, but by the end of his career, he was fantastic in the editing suite and really knew how to get the most out of it, how to make it. His movies were never too long. He said, well, definitely in the early days, he had a couple that were long, but later on, 
He was able to really figure out what to keep, what to cut, how to make it better using cuts sometimes. I think he made an incredible film here. And it's sadly, of the three, the one that people have seen the least, and yet it's so much fun. It's one that actually, of the three, I'd say it's the most easy to watch now, and the most easy to enjoy. It's just such a fun little film. And again, it's not a, f a feature film in the, in the traditional sense. It's not fiction although it is to a degree, which is kind of the point. It's a documentary, and the way the story it tells is one that you haven't heard, and it's a lot of fun. Now, after the first category, the truly great films, I put this next category I call Flawed Gems. And in here, I've got five movies. So the first one, his second feature film, 1942. I should have probably done the years for all of these. So Touch of Evil was 1958, FFA was 1974. The Magnificent Ambersons, 1942. This is his second feature film, and after Citizen Kane, he still had some of the control over the elements of the movie, but unfortunately, because he was sent on this mission to go to South America by the government to do kind of a propaganda film there around the Carnival, while he was away, the film studio basically came in, watched the film that he'd made, it hadn't been fully f finished in terms of editing, cut out the ending of the movie, changed the ending to be an upbeat ending instead of what should have been this tragic, almost like Requiem for a Dream-esque spiral into almost nihilism at the very end, which is kind of the point of the movie and the story, and took what would have been a very good movie and probably would have been in the first category that I have there and made it to me a flawed gem because it is good. It has some good elements. It's a, I will say of all the movies on this list, it's probably the hardest to watch as a modern viewer if you're somebody who just likes modern movies and just likes color movies and the way modern stories are told. It's a movie that's a, a lot about small details of character changes. It's almost like a one car why movie in that sense. Small emotional abruption, abrupt dissonance almost if that if that makes sense you'd have to watch the movie to kind of understand what i'm saying here but sadly the lack of that ending the lack of that arc that third arc to the story it just rips out the soul of the movie and destroys kind of what we, it was setting up to lead into and therefore it, it does just become a flawed movie because you may as well turn it off once you're two-thirds of the way in because the last third isn't awesome world's movie and you never get to see the culmination of it. And think about how many great movies, if you didn't see the ending, the rest of it wouldn't mean as much, wouldn't have the same significance, and could be enjoyable, but not truly great. So the cinema fucked that one up, and sadly, because the whole thing is they took away the ending, and they didn't ever let him back in to edit it up again. Now, sadly, they also accidentally deleted and destroyed all the fissing reels. So even though, you know, for the 40 years that have passed by now, I mean, obviously it came out a long time ago. In the last 40 years, at any time, someone, if they'd had the money, could have funded Awesome Wars to get those reels and re-edit it and put the film out how he wanted to. That can never happen, sadly. And that is a true tragedy that we'll never see that actual film because that was one where he had the full chance to make a great movie. He's not in this movie, which is another reason why it's not as good, I think, for modern people because Awesome Wars himself was an incredible actor. So that's another reason to watch his films. And uh, yeah, as I say, the ending just killed it. Now, one that he made, and it took him a long time, and he had to make it in terms of in the middle portion of his career towards the end, the back half, when he didn't have the budget and he was working in Europe and he wasn't in the Hollywood system, but still a great movie, is Chimes for Midnight, 1965. Now, this is a movie where I will say it's a Shakespeare movie and it doesn't attempt to adapt the language. Despite the fact he made other Shakespeare movies, which also use Shakespeare's original dialogue, I think, unfortunately, the language is a bit impenetrable for a lot of modern viewers with modern aesthetics and, and sensibilities. But it is still a great movie because he's in it and he plays a character of Falstaff that clearly fits him down to a T, what his acting skills are all about. He is incredible. His presence on the screen is fantastic. What this character goes through really shows the range of tragic acting that he can do of of bold emphatic acting of comedic acting he does a really fantastic job and he was someone who was always in love with the theater and always in love with Shakespeare and it really shows through this you can see the joy for Shakespeare and I'm personally not a huge Shakespeare fan myself I think some of it's good but you can see the passion from Wells in this movie and it certainly is a very good movie now a lot of people funnily enough they'd have this up in their first category truly great films rather than, than having it down here where I have it in Flawed Gems. But as I say, to me, it's not as complete a movie. It's not as good outside of Awesome Wells. And I think, unfortunately, the subject matter, I don't think is as fantastic as perhaps other people appreciate it for being. Now, beyond that, I'm going to go to The Trial, 1962, obviously based on the Fran Franz Kafka story. Now, this reinterpretation of Kafka really does make it into an Awesome Wells movie. Yeah, it was a Franz Kafka story, but this is an Awesome Wells movie. And the way he sets it up and the way he uses, I think it's Anthony Perkins, right? is really interesting and the tone of the story is so different than the actual original Kafka story but it, it takes the essence of it and it tells it out in an almost an absurdist manner 
And I actually like the way he makes this decision that, yeah, this guy's guilty. It's not the idea like in the Kafka novel, like, you know, he's the guy, it's the guy, it's the nightmare of being in like the Soviets, the police, the totalitarian state, right? That you're accused of a crime, you're never told what it is, you're guilty just because they say you are, and you, you're processed as a result. No, in the trial, it's a guy where, yeah, in some sense he is guilty, and it's, it's built that way, and it's told in this way where it's such an intense movie, and it, it has moments where it lets you breathe, it has the respite, but then it's always there, this looming, this ominous feeling, this... The atmosphere of the movie is probably the best element, and Anthony Perkins plays a very good role. Orson Welles isn't in it very much, but he is in it to some degree. And this is more like the tone and the style of the movie are interesting. It doesn't have as much of a plot. It doesn't have as much space for really incredible acting performance. So it's it's interesting. It's worth watching. It's a flawed gem, though. It's certainly good, but it's nothing superlative, I don't think. Now, second to last of these movies, I'm going to pick Mr. Arkadin, a.k.a. Confidential Report, 1955. So this was obviously a film in Orson Welles' Hollywood career. And this is just a film where, to me, it drives to the same kind of degree as Citizen Kane did, but without any of the polish and without any of the other secondary great performances. One of the first... What I like about it is that he is ambitious like Citizen Kane. It tries to tell this huge story in many locations and with different elements to it. The problem is, first of all, the, the editing of the movie... Now, the editing itself is decent enough, but the way the story's put together isn't particularly good. I don't, I don't think the story hangs together very well. The fact that, that Orson Welles isn't the central character, this just shows how important him being a fantastic actor was to his films. Because with the central actor that they have in this movie, it's a throwaway guy that you'll have never heard of. And I don't think he does a very good job. He's very standard. And Wells is in it, but not much, sadly, which is a key problem that the movie has. And so it doesn't pull off a lot of the elements. This is a creaky Orson Welles movie, even if it has many redeeming qualities, and it's worth watching if you've enjoyed his other movies. Now, the last of the movies I'll have in this category is going to be Othello, obviously uh, um, a Shakespeare play. And this came out in 1951. Now, I actually think this is... I would actually argue, personally, I think it's better than Chimes from Midnight. I think it's the best of his Shakespeare films. I think it's, admittedly, in the modern climate, people would go crazy about the idea he's playing essentially in blackface. He's playing like an Arab character, whereas, you know, he's obviously a white man. But I don't particularly care about that. He's such a good actor. He pulls it off even if that makeup's a little bit ropey. Obviously, he's someone where that's a perfect role for him as well. He really is set to play those king actor type roles. It's a role he always em embraced and he is fantastic. He has the gravitas to do it. He has the sort of bold, that almost the arrogance, the will to, to rule that you have to have if you're a king actor and a king itself for that matter. And he's someone who just commands with his presence on the screen. And he does a great job in this. Also, his old mate from the theater back in Ireland, uh, let me think, what was his name again? Michael something, wasn't it? I forget anyway. The guy who plays Iago does a very, very good job in this movie. That guy obviously was a fantastic theater actor and really shows his chops in this. He, he's the best actor in the movie, actually. He plays the, this role very, very well. It's really well done. The story's interesting, obviously. I think it's one of the better Shakespeare stories, actually. I think people in the modern day, this is absolutely, you're going to love the storyline. It's, it's a really, it pulls at the heartstrings and the way you get to see the, the scheming of the certain characters and how they play people off each other. I mean, if you like something like House of Cards, this should be right up your alley right here. It's also a movie where, because he didn't have the budget and it was taking him a long time to make it and he ran out of scenarios, like famously, there's a certain scene in it, one of the opening scenes that takes place in a bathhouse purely because he couldn't get the, the costumes to the set to make the this part of the movie. So he just did it. He had to figure out a way to film without the actors having to have costumes. So it's very ingenious how it's made. Yes, it's cobbled together. Yes, it's filmed in lots of different countries. Yes, some of the actors aren't so amazing, but there's so many redeeming qualities to it. It is very much still a gem, even if it is a flawed one. Now, the other movies that he made, the other five movies, I would categorize as... They have redeeming moments. If you really like Orson Welles and you like Orson Welles films, they're worth watching. But each of them has quite a lot of flaws and it's only the redeeming moments that make it worth it. So Journey Into Fear is one that probably the least amount of people who are watching this video now have seen of Orson Welles films. I don't think it's a movie that holds it very well. It was made in 1943, so very shortly after Citizen Kane and Magnificent Ambersons. It's a movie where if you look into the history of why it was made and how it came about, it's not really a movie he should have been involved in. It's not something that should be on his resume in many senses. It doesn't really do a good job as a film. It has all these flaws to it. You only watch it if you want to be a completist and see all the Orson Welles material. 
Now, that's not the case for the next film, which is 1946's The Stranger, which is a movie that, again, he directs and stars in as the central character. Now, he does a very good job as the central character. Now, obviously, he doesn't pull off the idea that he's German, etc., etc., but he does a very good job just as Orson Welles. He's a fantastic actor, and he shows nuance to his character, and he has some great dialogue in the movie, and he directs it. It's a very tight movie, a very crisp movie. has a very memorable ending. So it's a fun movie. It's a thriller. It's not some grand movie that will stand the test of time and is incredible in that sense. He even will said himself that he tried to make this movie kind of by the numbers to kind of show people in Hollywood that, you know, he wasn't some maniac, he wasn't some tyrant, he wasn't some guy that was out of control and would go over budget and wouldn't follow any of the kind of studio notes. So he tried to do it this way, still got locked out of the movie, still had the harsh treatment from Hollywood. And it kind of shows why that really was almost the end for him in Hollywood. And it's a good movie, but it's not trying to have the ambition and the scale and the drive to be something incredible. And it isn't. Although his, his performance is very good in it. Then you've got... The Lady from Shanghai, 1947. Now, this is a movie he made in part, seemingly, to do the movie with his then, well, it had been his wife, Rita Hayworth, who's a very beautiful woman and a Hollywood starlet of the day. And a movie that he did, he always claims this story, but I've noticed it's changed. If you read many of the, do of the documentary and books and et cetera, and articles and interviews, the story changes every time as to how this movie came about. So I'm not sure I believe all of it, but essentially he made this story in theory at a whim. It wasn't like a great piece of work that he was trying to convert into. It was kind of just a paperback. And so it does play out like a movie that's come from just a paperback. That isn't an incredible story. It doesn't have great writing. But some of the editing is interesting. Some of the scenes that take place are interesting. The way he tells the story, I mean, his accent is fucking dire in this movie, but it's almost comedic in that sense, because if you like Olsen Wells, you're watching the movie anyway, and you don't mind that his accent is ropey as all hell. In some ways, it's funny, though, in that sense, if you, if you view it from a comedic lens. And yeah, the story's a bit, I won't say obvious because it's not, some of the twists are interesting, but the story is a bit simplistic in terms of how it, how it plays out. There's not really a whole lot of depth to these characters and where they're going in the story. It's worth watching, certainly, and it's a thriller and, and it'll keep you going a little bit. Macbeth came out in 1948. It's probably the worst of his Shakespeare films. I still think it has redeeming qualities because he's playing a king. He's playing Shakespeare. It's Orson Welles in a leading role. This is early in his career, 1948. He's still a young man. He's still a very beautiful man who can portray kind of the, the character of Macbeth. I think he does a good job. The problem is, first of all, the Scottish accents in the movie is terrible. Some parts, like he doesn't really have much set here, doesn't have a whole lot of money to make the film. It's made very cheaply in that sense. So it's very much theater of the mind. It's worth watching, but it's not a great movie. It's not even a particularly good movie. It's just an okay movie. And the last one, another one up there with Journey to Fear that almost no one's gonna have seen, The Immortal Story, 1968. So later in his career, I can see why he made the movie. Again, he's in a secondary role, which is the reason it's not as good because he's an older guy at this point in time. And he has to play secondary characters. The story, to me, isn't that compelling, but it's decent enough. It's got some aspects that are under decent. Problem is, at this point in time, he can't get top-level actors, necessarily. It's just, it's not, there's nothing unduly special about the way it's edited or directed. It's just an okay movie that, again, I would only recommend to completists, quite frankly. So the key thing about Orson Welles is he's most well-known for his directing. And as a director, he is truly great. I mean, he first and foremost, the first quality I would have to describe him as is ambitious. He takes every movie and you can see that what the material he's coming from, it's the idea. And then the idea infects him in a way where he comes up and he'll go for, he'll try to do different things, innovative things, groundbreaking things with every little idea. And every big idea has to be done in some grand fashion. And so the ambition is staggering. The risk taking and trying to do new things is so, it's so provocative. It's so alluring. It's so compelling. He's a guy who clearly pushes his actors to get very specific, extreme performances out of them. But in doing so, some of them give their best performances of their career. And some of the ones that aren't the big name actors, you never see them in a good movie again, aside from the ones that he was in. Sadly, he didn't get enough chances to direct within the Hollywood system at a high, high level and have full control over the directing. And therefore, as a result, despite the fact he is already one of the greats and did some fantastic movies, he could have done a lot more in this respect. An area, as I've alluded to before, that he's very underrated in is as an editor. I actually think his his sense for what to edit and then the order in which to edit. He's one of those guys who didn't just tell a story from A to B. He mixed it up and he made it thematic and he made aspects play into what would happen later and allude to something but not give you it all quite yet. And that, was, that made his movies so intellectually stimulating to watch. 
And I think he's a very underrated ed editor, as I say. Now, unfortunately, being too much of a perfectionist in the real sense, not that bullshit that most people say. When most people say they're a perfectionist, I think it's bullshit. I think it's an excuse to not do stuff. That's not the case in his scenario. He really did want to just make these things better than ever and continue trying to do incredible things and push the budget and push the limits of what you can do with film. And so if he'd ever had the full backing and the time and had lived longer, he could have gotten more of these movies out and they would have been more incredible as a result, in my opinion. But unfortunately, that also is something that limited some of the elements of the editing so that people don't always recognize that as much. Now, one area where whether you like his directing or editing at all, I don't think it's dispute. I don't think you can really dispute what an actor this guy was. He could have just had a career purely as an actor. And in fact, maybe if he had, and he had, hadn't always wanted to be behind the camera as well and be in charge of the film, he might be a better known person right now. He might have had a greater career to some people, not to me, but to some people, because as an actor, he was an incredible actor. It's funny that whenever he did later interviews, he always referred to himself as a king actor, as someone who plays that like authoritative figure or a king in, in theater, obviously, and play that role. Yes, he is one of the best of all time, most remembered for that, because in a lot of his later movies, he plays that role. And that's a role that he would often be kind of brought in as a, as a cast actor for other movies to earn money. But that's only a role he settled into later in his life. You put him as the star, as the leading man in the early days, he was incredible. If he'd wanted to go only down that route, I mean, I've seen some of the films he's just an actor in, Jane Eyre, etc. These aren't great movies, but he does a great job on them. He's really, really good. He has this incredible charisma, etc. It's only later he had to settle into the king actor because as an older guy, especially when he put on a lot of weight, he couldn't pull off being the leading actor anymore, being the leading man. That's why you see him in A Man For All Seasons, a fantastic movie, by the way, Catch-22. Yeah, he's just playing that king actor role and he does settle into that and get typecast to some degree. But earlier in his career, he had incredible charisma. He's a very talented guy, on screen and off screen, if you listen to interviews. Just someone who, it does leap off the screen. I often say this about the truly great actors from the 40s to the 60s, that before you had more of the great directors and more of the great films and, and more acting school type of passing down of knowledge and technique to the lesser actors. A lot of the original actors were fantastic in a natural sense and a self-taught way. They were autodidacts in that sense. And so they leap off the screen and they're incredible and they're full multicolor, even in black and white movies, as it were, metaphorically. And everyone else around them is like a cardboard cutout just reading lines. Well, what's that? You don't say it and I'll see you tomorrow then. Oh, yeah. And then they're doing actual acting. So he's one of those guys. He's just incredible in anything he's in. And I've watched a lot of his movies where he's just a guy playing a casted character in the not the main character in any way and he's really good in his part regardless of what the movie is some of the movies fucking terrible movies by the way a lot not a, not that big a fan where he has to do weird accents such as russian accents or french accents as you might have seen in some of his movies that he was in not his movies but ones that he appeared in i also think in this sense he was underused by hollywood since he was kind of against the system and since he was wanting to be a director and have that full control and aim for something bigger he didn't just let himself be the leading man and be uh, and have his name be ridden in that sense and be in more of the movies and be the leading actor in the biggest movies of the year for the next 20 years. He could have been from 1941 to 1961, the leading actor in all the big movies if he'd want. He had that kind of talent in that range. He just didn't get to explore it as much because he went a different path. I also think he's someone where once you move beyond the different roles and you look at him holistically, you look at the entire man, the artist or someone's. First of all, he is an artist. It's not just a director. It's not just an editor. He's not just an actor. This is someone who I can so appreciate his vision that he had for his art and the way he thought about things and his ambition and his drive to do things. When he was battled and beaten down by the Hollywood system, he could have just given in and become an actor and made a lot of money. He could have just said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just give up being a director or, you know what, this is the end for me. He could have just retired entirely and gone and done other things in life. He was a guy who was very, could have been a politician, could have done all sorts of things and been very successful because of his charisma and his talent. But he didn't and he didn't give up and he kept making movies. And even though he wasn't in the Hollywood system, and this is the days where you didn't make big movies outside the Hollywood system, he kept going to make movies and he made good movies. And he made movies that, yes, yeah, some of them were flawed, but they were good in spite of the flaws. And they were movies where they were fantastic for the amount of money that was used to make them and the people he had to beg to be in the movies and go, the places he had to go to film these different things and how much of it he did all on his own and not with a whole studio back him up. And he didn't, his career didn't just end at the end of the 40s with the end of the Hollywood period. He had incredible movies beyond that. And that's thanks to his drive and his unerring ambition that he was going to do great things. And he used his acting to finance these movies. He took money he made elsewhere and he didn't just 
spend it on a house or a lovely time. He took that money and he used it to pay an actor's fee to be in a movie that he wanted to make, to pay for the reels of film, the equipment to make the movie he wanted to make, to pay for the travel, for people to go to a place to film in the particular scenes he wanted to. He essentially parlayed money from other people's movies, Hollywood movies, into his own projects. I mean, it's the logic of how a startup can succeed if it's got really talented people. Part of the way it can succeed without much money is the people who are really talented, who want the startup to succeed, and they're the people founding it, are willing to give their own time almost for free to get it going. So they're able to give you a lot of talent that's worth a lot, but without having to pay for it, therefore they can cut the costs and make it for cheap. That's kind of what he was doing, using his own labor. And as a result, that's why he does these bit parts and all these other movies, which in their own right are fantastic to fund these other movies that didn't have to exist, but thanks to his will, thanks to his efforts, they did exist. And some of them were obviously great and many of them worth watching. He's someone who knew how to use himself. I mean, kind of later on, figured out the role that he should do later in his life, but fantastic even in early in his career. And his other actors, he got some great performances out of other people around him, especially some of the lesser actors later in his career. His work ethic was incredible. And this is a key detail that really influenced me. Because I remember this interview comment where he said something along the lines that he isn't a hard worker. He's not a disciplined person. But if he ever gave up, if he ever just stopped doing what he was doing, that's why he kept himself working, he'd disappear into a hammock and you'd never hear from him again. I always thought of that because I was someone for most of my life where I thought to myself internally, I'm a lazy person. I don't like work because of the fact I didn't like to apply myself to schoolwork or things that you had to do for a job, etc. And so I thought, oh, that's what work is. And so I have defined that as work. I don't like that. So I'm going to stay over here. I only like to fuck around and use my talent and play. What I didn't realize was when you get something enjoyable and then you apply work ethic to it, you can be the hardest worker in the world because you enjoy it and it's fantastic and you embrace it and you can work harder than other people who make themselves do work they don't enjoy. He's someone who really kind of got that through to me and I saw from his career how beneficial that could be even when you were in difficult times how you could make the best out of what you had if you applied yourself to what you loved and that's the key detail. He's someone where he clearly was in love with cinema. I mean, he could absolutely have gone to another medium he could have gone and written books or been an interview host or been a politician or been a radio host again. Could have done all these other things and expressed himself artistically. But he clearly was so in love with the magic of cinema. I mean, I remember him saying about how he went to visit, I think it was Gary Cooper, on a film. And he watched them filming a few scenes before he was going to go out of lunch. And then he said to like the director or something like, is that it? And they were like, oh, yeah, that'll be the final take. And the whole point is, when you watched it in real life as a person, you were like, well, this is nothing. Like, I mean, this isn't great acting. It's not good. But he said, when you watched The Rushes, when you watched it uh, as a film on the screen, you saw the magic. Suddenly it was there. Suddenly the scene looked incredible. And the way it was shot and the way it was acting meant so much. And that's something that really kind of captured captivated and haunted Orson Welles his whole career. And that's why he had to make movies because he knew there was something special about this medium and he understood this medium and could express himself in this medium in a way he couldn't in any other. And that's one of the reasons he continued on. And in that case, I really respect him. I mean, in another world, I could have seen him going down the route of a Jodorowsky where the Hollywood system, well, it wasn't Hollywood for Jodorowsky, but movies that you want to make can't be financed. You can't do them yourself. You don't have the money. And so John Ross went into comic books and did his stories as comic books. And if anything, got more done there and has done incredible work. If Orson Welles had had another medium or tried, maybe he could have got more done in that sense, but it wouldn't have been the same. It wouldn't have been his films. We wouldn't have had F for Fake. We wouldn't have had Touch of Evil. We wouldn't have had these great latter-day movies, The Trial. I mean, not great in that sense, but good movies, certainly. Ones that are worth watching. His career clearly could have been much more, despite the greatness of what it is. In fact, it's the journey and the effort and the struggle that contributes to the greatness as much as the movies do themselves. Because yes, he didn't do that many movies as a director. Yes, he didn't act as the leading man in that many movies. Yes, he did a lot of movies that had low budget and didn't have so many great actors and had to be go all around Europe to do it and had to steal from Peter and beg from Paul and all the rest of it. That's not even the way that idiom works, but I'm, I'm just gonna use it that way. And had to do all these things and struggle and in the end, some of them were a bit ropey, yes. But the key thing is, he continued on and wouldn't give up. I mean, there are actually so many movies that were unreleased that he was working on, that he had fractions of or components of that didn't get finished. I mean, there's a documentary called The One Man Band that was a German documentary, which really goes through this and looks at some of these movies and shows you some of them. And yeah, yes, some of that was over editing to perfection or not having the money yet to complete a scene or leaving something on hold while you work on another project and fall in love with that and you want to come back at one point and obviously you die at some point in time so you don't have a chance to work on it at, that, at any point. So there could have been so much more to this guy's career despite how special he was. 
He also was clearly a very stubborn individual. Like even as much as a lot of things that were done to him were very unfair, he was a person who had the vision. He's one of those guys who really bore out the idea that yes, the director has the one vision and you've got to go with that. If you have it decided by committee and other people interject their ideas, as much as this might sound like a very Ayn Randian rant, it's going to corrupt that and it's going to make it lesser and it's going to be something designed by committee that might appeal to a lot of people in the lowest common denominator, but it's not going to be one pure vision. And to me, art is about one singular vision, even if it means people working towards one singular vision, which is the ideal scenario when you're in a team scenario and it's not just a one individual, one person doing it only. So he was stubborn, but I think in many ways it was justified and you see that in his best films. It's clear that because he was a child prodigy, because he was so successful for the first 20, 30 years, that people resented him, especially because of Citizen Kane. And people did close doors for him. And people did use politics behind the scenes and backstab him and fuck him over and deny him work opportunities. And yeah, this is all terrible stuff. And that's a real shame. And that's another reason why his career could have been more. It's also clear that he came too early in history. If he'd have come in 1960 and started doing what he's doing, he could have been embraced. He would have had more opportunities. He could have done so much more. And obviously he would have been alive later. So he could have gotten into this era where it's very cheap to make movies and think of what he could do in the 2000s with simple camera technology, the ability to edit and perhaps even crowdfund and release on the... It, it, that's actually almost tragic to even think about because he didn't live to that period. He died in 1985, as I see. So he never got to see the days when it couldn't be like price or logistical aspects locking you out of being able to make something in your medium. Because as I alluded to before about moving to another medium, that's the problem with movies. They cost a lot of money. You have to go to a lot of locations. It's really difficult to make them. It's not like writing a book or painting, things where you need very simple initial ingredients, as it were, to make the, uh, the best ever thing written or the best ever thing painted. You need, there's, a, there's more of a logistic limitation bottleneck that is money on movies and the ability to make them, sadly, in that era. So if you'd have come late, I think you would have been incredible in that respect. It's also quite clear that despite what a charismatic person he was and what a fantastic actor he was, for some reason, he was bad at networking. He just couldn't get these Hollywood people, he couldn't win them over like the other stars could. He couldn't get people to fund his movies as much. He couldn't get people later on to do a movie with him that he wanted to do movies with, and he missed a lot of opportunities as a result. And that's just a, a character flaw that he had as a person. Who knows why? Now, there's a lot of other material out there, if you like Orson Welles, beyond his films, that you can read and, and view and consume that will help you appreciate him for. First and foremost, I would say, go and read a book called Against the System. It is the best Orson Welles biography because it's actually not just a biography. It's about the full storyline of these films that he made and his work within the Hollywood system and the, the movie notes he has and telegrams he sent people and a real chronology. And it's very in-depth and it really shows how incredibly tough his struggle was in Hollywood and how people really fucked with this guy over and over again and his battles and his misfortunes along the way and it's clear that he really was I mean I've referenced this many times in videos before but he really was the first one where other people benefited from what he went through there was that big brother syndrome where he's the one that Hollywood didn't understand and couldn't control and so cast out and didn't want anything to do with and advised everyone not to be like only to later on realize by the time we get to the 70s that what we've realized now which is like yeah you can make a lot of money with just the blockbusters and just the, the safe movies but you still need those those geniuses those christopher nolan type guys who will make an incredible movie with great ambition and vision and can not only be incredible and critically acclaimed but can be some of the biggest and most successful movies ever made and so i feel like those maverick filmmakers of the 70s really benefited from Hollywood fucking up and doing it wrong with Orson Welles, like the bigger brother, they're the younger brother, and therefore the parents then realized how to treat the younger brother, who's similar, or of a kindred spirit, in a different manner that allowed them to flourish more, and I think modern day cinema directors definitely benefit from this. I mean, there's rumors that Denis Villeneuve will direct Dune, I mean, that alone shows you that, yes, People can be allowed vision and to do very daring things and be ambitious and not always have them land. And people will ultimately still respect them. And as long as some of their movies do well, give them these chances that people like Orson Welles didn't get. There's a documentary that came out very recently called The Magician, like The Astonishing Life of Orson Welles or something. I think that's a very good documentary. It's more modern, so it gets to capture a lot of the stuff in it. I don't think it's so complete. I mean, you have to watch a lot of documentaries to get all the story with Orson Welles, but it does a great job of showing his passion and how he edited and some of the problems he had and some interview details he might not have seen. I think it's very good, especially for the beginner. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, an interview slash documentary by Arena, which was called The Awesome Wells Story. It was a British 
TV show, so it'll be on YouTube. And this has fragments of a great interview cut with film of, of his movies. And this is really like almost his take on, here's what was going on with Kane, and here's what I was trying to do with Magnificent Amberson, how they fucked it up. And then here's Chimes at Midnight and what I thought of that. And here's some of my more flawed movies later on and what was going on with Tuck. You know, it, it's really complete and it's really hit one, at least at some point in his life, one of his versions of it. And he's a fantastic interview subject. He's so charismatic. He's so interesting to listen to. Even has an interesting voice, very funny, very witty guy, comes up with lots of great lines. Lines. And interestingly enough, there might yet be another feature film from Awesome Wars released because a movie that a lot of aficionados of his movies will be aware of is one that was unreleased. It was called The Other Side of Wind and it featured John Huston, the legendary director, playing the role of a director who's got a movie coming out and people, it's kind of like half mockumentary, like fake documentary and half feature film. And it looked incredible. It had Peter Bogdanovich in as well. And it certainly looked like it could have been a flawed gem, like a very interesting movie. Yeah, maybe it, doesn't, it wasn't fully completed, therefore it wouldn't be incredible. But it was held up with legal problems for a long time. Some of the footage was lost at some point in time, I think. Many times over the last 15 years, there have been stories that's going to come out, it's going to be produced, it's going to finally... But supposedly, it is now finally going to come out because Netflix, apparently, are now involved with getting it developed and getting it out there, and it will somehow come out. And I don't think it will ultimately be like the magnum opus or whatever. Yeah, he probably did that early in his career. But it, it could certainly be a very good movie, and for me, I will absolutely watch it. So Orson Welles, yes, he was a king actor. Yes, he was a very good director. Yes, he was all these things and more, and he was someone who was mistreated, and he didn't necessarily get all the opportunities that other people with his level of talent did, but he made the most of the opportunities he had. He was a very hard worker. He was a visionary and he was a true artist in that respect.